Hello, my name is Vanessa Davila and today I'm doing transduction of light. We'll be covering transduction of light, light energy to neural energy, optic nerve impulses, and Merleau-Ponty. So transduction of light. So we have 97 million light receptors in the eye. Um, the eye is also the spherical structure that you can see and it's filled with a clear fluid. Um, there's a white covering and that's known as the sclera and it is opaque except for the cornea area that we see on this diagram, which is transparent. Um, the iris is directly behind the cornea, which gives the eye its color. We have the iris that controls um, how much light enters the eye through contractions. So when you have bright light environments, um, you get a contraction, and when you have uh, dim environments, you get a relaxation of the iris. Um, so then we have the retina, which you can see on the diagram, is um, the light-sensitive tissue at the back of the eye, and it's made up of light receptors, um, light-sensitive receptors called rods and cones, and um, neural cells that are connected with these rods and cones. And then we have um, when light enters the eye through the cornea and the refractive. Um, so the cornea has refractive properties um, and it bends the light rays that enter through the cornea in a way to allow the light to pass freely through the pupil in the center of the iris. So the iris then retracts when there's bright light conditions and after the light passes um, the iris, the light rays pass through the lens, which can also be seen on this diagram. Um, and the lens is a clear, flexible structure that shortens and lengthens in width um, in order to focus on the light rays properly. And then the light then passes through that liquid in the eye um, and the light ray comes to a sharp focusing point in the retina um, in which the retina then receives this image from the cornea, focuses on it, and converts it to these electrical impulses which are carried into the optic nerve and then to the brain. Okay, so now we have light energy to neural energy. So photoreceptors are located at the back of the eye and they connect with bipolar cells, um, which are also connected to ganglion cells. And the ganglion cells have these axons that form the optic nerve. Um, light has to pass through these bipolar and ganglion cells um, to, get the photo, to get to the photoreceptors. And the neural cells are small and see-through, so they cannot block out light. Um, the photoreceptors contain light-sensitive chemicals that are known as photopigments. Um, and photopigments absorb energy from the light and um, cause some molecules to break down into two components. And this causes a chemical reaction, which then causes a neural response. Um, these two components later recombine um, in order to keep up that photopigment supply. We also have um, the rods and cones that contain different types of photopigments. So the rods and cones have differing chemical contents and their neural connections give them different specializations, um, but they function in similar manners. And then we, the rods um, are containing rhodopsin, which absorbs light quicker, meaning um, that in they're meant for lower light conditions. So in bright light, rhodopsin is actually broken down, um, so the rods are no longer useful in bright light situations. And edopsin, which is found in cones, that's a cone photopigment, um, it requires high light intensity environments. Um, and it functions well during the day, but it becomes non-functional at night or during the dark uh, dark environments. There's three types of I iodopsin, um, and it also is within different types of cones. So this allows for a response to different wavelengths of light. So the cones only sense different wavelengths, but the rods differentiate only by the amount, the level of light. Uh, conditions. So rods are located 20 degrees from the fovea, whereas the cones are located in the fovea. So one cone synapses into a single bipolar cell, which then synapses into a single ganglion cell. Um, so we have few cones that share ganglion cells. Um, so the fovea is actually, ha it has a lot of um, high visual acuity. Um, and in dark situations, those photoreceptors um, they have sodium and ion uh, calcium channels that open to allow ions to flow freely, um, making the membrane partially depolarized. Um, and it releases glutamate, which hinders bipolar cell activity. 
but that's during dim conditions. When light enters photoreceptors and hits them, um, it closes off that sodium calcium channel and it decreases glutamate and the bipolar cells release more neurotransmitters, which increases ganglion cell firing. So it wakes up those ganglion cells. Okay, so we're going to talk about the optic nerve and the optic chiasm. So axons of the ganglion cells, they join and pass out of each eye to form two optic nerves. The two optic nerves run to just the front of the pituitary pituitary gland and they join for a short distance at the optic chiasm before separating again and traveling to the first synapse in the lateral genucleate nuclei lgn for short um, of the thalamus at the optic chiasm we see axons from the nasal sides of the eyes cross to the other side and they go to the occipital lobe in the opposite hemisphere um, there's a visual field that we have which is the part of the environment that is registered by our retina um, we have information from the right half of each eye that transmits in to the right hemisphere of the brain um, and then each um, the information coming into each eye is separate and processed in discrete areas of the primary visual cortex which is also known as v1 um, and then we see that this information then goes to the occipital lobe Okay, let's talk about Merleau-Ponty. So I first wanted to bring up the concept of painting. Um, so he says that painting is a form of seeing. It's a language, um, the language of painting. It's um, not necessarily objects that we're looking at, but yet we still see them as existing in so far as they awaken in our bodies an echo of the object itself. And because our bodies welcome them, this is a form of a cardinal carnal formula. Um, we also see that Merleau-Ponty says that there's this problem going on with science where it manipulates things and gives up on living things. Um, it deduces us to simply more like robots and data collecting techniques or machines in a sense. And science tends to ground people in these objects um, or, you know, these things that we're observing, which becomes the new philosophy in a sense. But he says that painting is different. It's completely different. It's pure. It's innocence because it goes against this operationalism way of thinking because art is innocent and it looks at the brute meaning of things and the painter can look at everything and not have to assess its values so that political slogan of knowledge and actions hold no value um, a painter includes not just his mind but paints with his body um, and he has to lend the world his body in order for the artist to change the world into the painting. So your body is a part of the world. He's show, uh, painting, he's showing that painting makes and makes people realize that your body is a part of this world. It has to be. And that's how painting is even possible. Um, it's making vision attached to movement. Um, we see what we look at. The seer does not seize what he is seeing, but approaches the world simply by looking at it, opening up into the world um, he's portraying the painter himself portrays the visible world through the use of his body as well not just his mind okay so now we're going to talk about this vision versus sight so vision is a neurobiological process of transcription it's a neural stimulus that converts into chemical signals it's a very biological definition of the way we see and perceive. However, seeing is expressive. It's a positional stance in the world and it requires a seer. Um, it, seeing is constructive. We create the world we see. It isn't given to us, it's not handed to us, or a recording of the world, but it's an active taking up of the world in our perception. Um, seeing is actively taking in the world around us. It's an active encounter. And it's not good to say that we're reaching out and simply perceiving the world, which gets us into this idea, um, these theories of vision, which is intromission and emission. So intromission is the sensory information um, that strikes an object, then the light comes and reflects off that object into our eyes, and it reflects on our retina, and the photoreceptors transduce that signal to a neurochemical into neurochemicals and that information transmits back into our occipital lobe um, where perception is processed 
And then we have the idea of emission, right? Which is that idea that something leaves our eyes and it's so it's outwardly going out. Something leaves our eyes and it strikes and touches into the seeable world. So it leaves to question, am I actively participating in the world or am I just being a passive sensory apparatus that information from the world boulders over? And right, we see that in this previous slide, how I just talked about Merleau-Ponty saying, no, no, seeing requires an active encounter. It requires you to be involved in what you are seeing and you cannot separate or detach the perceiver from what's being perceived, right? It's all one experience. So that idea of a mission is invalid in a sense, right? Because it's the idea that something has to come out of us and separate from us and we're being passive. No, we're being active perceivers. Um, so that's in a sense an artificial way to separate a person from the world. Um, this idea fell out of favor because nothing also biologically nothing in a sense leaves our eyes um, and in a figurative sense like Merleau-Ponty says we're actively taking up the world we're not artificially separated from the world we're an active seer in this world we're a part of the world okay so perceive uh, perceiver and perceived we see in Virgil the man who had cataracts and he regained his sight. He was blind, living blind for a while. We see SB who was a blind man at 10 months old and he gets his sight back. We see that Miss um, S, she has this disability where she can only really see with the right half and her left side, she doesn't, she neglects and cannot perceive from her left side. Okay, but what does this have to do with perceiver and perceived, right? So Merleau-Ponty saying everything that we see in the world, it's, it's us. Like we see that it's facts. We're not passively taking in information. No one's handing this information saying, this is true. This is how the world is. We actively take up the world as it is. And these individuals are actively taking up the world in their own perceptions. Virgil, he prefers taking up the world through touch. He doesn't trust his sense of sight because he's lived as a blind man for so long. Whereas a normal person who has had sight for since birth, we trust our sight. That's the way we perceive the world. To Virgil's case, he sees it through touch. That doesn't necessarily make it false or true. That's not the case in this situation. It's just the way he takes up the world, right? SB. He was a man who also regained his sight, but he relied a lot on touch, just like Virgil. We also see that Miss S relies on her right side, and she prefers to have that certain way of perceiving the world, of doing the turn to be able to make sure she didn't leave anything out from the left side. She doesn't want to look through a mirror and perceive the world through that. It makes her uncomfortable. It makes her feel artificial, unnatural way of seeing. Um, so in a sense, each of these people have their own way of perceiving the world, which is true in fact to them. And that's the way the perceiver in the perceived works. We all perceive the world in a different way. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.